where we all kind of take turns scaring one another, which is probably should be my favorite time of the year. Uh, but it is that time of year where all the everything happens and everybody tries to scare one another. Um, but you know, the scariest thing I think the world looks at, and, and, and they, it's not in the vampires. I mean, I don't know why we get so fascinated with certain created images, as demonic as they come, but even those things do not scare us as bad as this one thing. And there's this one thing that just seems to scare the bejeebies out of this world. It's not even Ebola. Um, nor is it going to be the thing that you think of as ISIS. It's not even that. There's one scary thing that's probably worse than all that together. Let's pray together. Father, we ask you that you will just let your word be illuminated in our hearts, not just our minds. Lord, I thank you that you can re- change our minds. You can bring reform to our minds. You can uh, help us to uh, see those things of the enemy to be brought down in our minds. But Lord, I thank you that you build us up in our body, our soul, and our spirit, according to your word. And I thank you for that, Lord, in the name of Jesus. Amen. The scariest thing? The cross. Don't believe me? Start looking at what they try to do here in America. And they had a World War II veterans uh, memorial. It's been up for a long time out on the side of the road, just a cross. Just a cross. And they say, we don't need that up there anymore. You need to take that down. You had the, during the 9-11, when you had the cross members that stood after the buildings fell, they said, we don't want that as a part. Now, some of these are still a part and they're still everything, but there are people, there are atheists, there are others that say, we want nothing to do with that. It's one of the scariest things to the world. Because one, one reason, it, what it symbolizes You start talking about the cross. We have symbols of crosses all around us. We have symbols that we understand what it's all about. But then when the world looks at it and they start looking at it, they go, this has got to be the scariest thing in the world. It's scarier than vampires and werewolves because they won't ban those. There's not an atheist movement that says we don't want the vampire diaries not to come out. There's not an atheist movement that says we don't want this or we don't want that. But they do go against the cross. Wow, isn't that amazing how just a painted cross on the side of the road, even some states have had to ban those because of atheists saying, we don't want those even on the side of the road as a reminder of a loved one that died at that point. There are people all around the world that when you start speaking of the cross, and we understand that because you can see the symbols that maybe in the Muslim world, we have the crescent moon and stuff, and you have the, the things in the star and all that in the, in the, in the Muslim world. You, it identifies with a thought pattern. It identifies with something. Every organization has its symbol. Every organization has some kind of symbol somewhere. I know I can look at uh, all the motorcycle folks, even the gangs, the ones that aren't gangs, the ones just clubs. They all have their symbols. They have their patches they wear. You have to earn your patches through different aspects. If you're an outlaw motorcycle gang, you basically got to kill somebody to get certain patches. If you're just a regular club, you got to do good deeds to get your patches. But as I look at all the things and the symbols and the things that are around us, the most powerful and scary symbol that we see is the, the power of the cross. You look over even in the Middle East where some of the Muslims are taking over and Christians, they are crucifying people again on a cross. Not as something they believe, but it's spun to be a mockery saying, we have overcome you guys, and so you get to die on a cross. That's the persecution they're doing to Christians even right now. But it's funny because they, not funny in a sense, but it's, it's ironic in the sense they're putting them on a cross to bring great fear and shame. Yes, they're bringing fear, but you know what they're doing? Every drop of blood that was shed on the cross of Calvary and every drop of blood that's been shed on a cross that's symbolizing his loss is bringing life. You can crucify every Christian in the Middle East. You know what? Their blood cries out the message of Jesus Christ. We start looking at the cross and we wonder why it's so powerful. I start wondering if, if in, in what we look at and what we preach is Jesus Christ. And, and when you start preaching Jesus Christ, people hang crosses around their neck. We hang them as a symbol of whose we are. It's the, it's the embodiment of our message is the cross. One of the scariest things you try to explain, isn't it, times? Wear a cross around your neck. And how many times have you been asked, what does that mean? Or does that mean anything to you? And then you have to explain, well, no, this is just a, something I got out of the, uh, a trinket store. Or this is just something I, I bought because I thought it was neat. 
But folks, I want to tell you something. If you wear a cross, you need to be able to put the message behind that cross. You need to be able to put the message and say, yes, this symbolizes what has happened to me in my life when I came to a crossroads point in my life. I had to make a decision. See, the cross is about the crossroads. The cross is about where our lives have been changed, where God did a divine intervention in us. That's what the cross is all about. That's why when we, I can't watch them, to be honest with you. They've got YouTube videos of people that have been hung on a cross nowadays, Christians, because they would not deny Christ. And so they said, you don't want to deny him. We will kill you and hang your body on a cross just like his. I can't really watch those videos. But I look at it and I see the reports of these things. And there are times that we're ashamed to tell somebody why we even wear one. And I look at this and I wonder what was the crossroads in my life. It was a point in my life to where I knew there was an awakening that happened in my life. Just like it has happened in your life at some point or another. Or if it hasn't, it can be today. You had to come to some crossroads point in your life where you realize, you know what? I've got to make a decision because I am heading in a certain direction. The crossroads appeared all through the Bible. You'll see the crossroads is when a decision is made and God is exalted. In those crossroad times. Not every time is God exalted because we don't always make the best decisions, do we? There are times that we make decisions out of what I would call our lower nature, our flesh, or what we saw in Scripture, the uncircumcised heart. We make those decisions like as go back to Genesis when you bring Adam and Eve to the crossroads when they're standing in the garden and God said, you can eat of all these, but just don't eat of this one. And so if they're standing there at the tree, they stand at the crossroads, they hear the whispering of the enemy or maybe even the loud voice of the enemy. I wasn't there. Well, there are a few of you maybe were there, but I wasn't there in the garden. But I know that I look at it and I'm sitting there and I'm going, okay, there are times that we stand at the crossroads because that is the place of a choice. That's why the cross is so significant even today in our society because it symbolizes a choice that has to be made. That's why when you see even in schools and you see in public arenas that they're saying you cannot put these upon a public square, I'm going because it challenges us that we stand and have to make a decision one way or the other. It's a reminder that you have to make the decision. When Adam and Eve were standing at the crossroads and God told them, it says, just don't eat of this tree. You can have everything. I'm giving you just free reign. Just this is the choice I ask you not to make. But instead, mm, this is good stuff. And at that crossroads was when we were cross-wired in our innate ability to make choices. Because you know what? I tell you, folks, if I'm given the choice of sin or righteousness, a lot of times we lean towards sin, don't we? We lean towards when you've been offended, what happens? Well, you stand at the crossroads every time. God tells us in Scripture, and Cindy, you're a great lead in on this. Thank you so much. And you stand at the crossroads. You got optional things in here that you got. You got to make a choice. And when you, somebody offends you, the Bible tells you to forgive them. I'm sitting there going, but I don't want to forgive them. I'm standing at the crossroads. But the cross is a reminder. It's because of Jesus Christ I can make a right decision. It's because of Jesus Christ that my hard wire of my sin nature has been changed. I stand at the crossroads and I wonder at times, and as I stand at the cross, I'm reminded that God has changed me. He has changed you. That's why the cross is so significant. There's power in the cross. You can get all the, the weirdness of Hollywood and they can be interviewed and they can talk about it. And then, and then one of the things that's so disappointing to me is when I hear a preacher and, and they'll talk and, and, and they give any kind of inclination that, that there are other ways besides Jesus Christ. That just breaks my heart because that diminishes the power of the cross. It diminishes the power that everyone in this world is going to have to make a choice. That's why we see in Philippians, the second chapter, that every knee is going to bow. Every tongue is going to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. At some point, that's going to happen in the future. Right now, we have a choice to make. And I look at the choices that I see the world making even now. And I wonder, as God, because this is the way God is most of the time. He does give us those choices. We get and God gives us emphasis, and I go to Matthew, the seventh chapter, and I, I like it because Jesus kind of lays it out there. And it also reminds me of when Aunt Fleet used to preach every Sunday in my church in Tennessee, and she would stand up, and she loved to preach this. And it says, Enter through the narrow gate, for the wide is the gate, and broad is the road that leads to destruction, for many enter through it. 
but small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to the path of life. Only few will find it. That's the crossroads, folks. That's that place. And if you've ever been hiking, I like going hiking, but I also like going hiking where they got the trails marked. <laughs> that way you don't have to throw breadcrumbs out and then birds eat it and you won't get back home. But now we got GPS. That's a great thing. I can remember I went hiking with several of the youth and uh, well, I had uh, two of the youth with me and another semi-leader guy with me went up to Oak Mountain and one of the problems that we ran into was I went off with one of the youth and I was talking to him. It was, it was just a guy thing. We were up there just talking about the Lord and so I said, come here, let's just spend a little bit of time. Let's talk. And, and so the other semi-leader took the other guy off and, and before the day was over, uh, hours later, and we couldn't find the other two, um, realized that that GPS chip that was supposed to be in his brain was not there. And uh, there are some people, some of y'all were not born with that chip. You know, they just don't have it. And it's okay. They've got apps for that now. And uh, instead of going up Peavine Falls to find where the falls were, they kept walking down till they finally exited the park. And uh, hours later, I'm wondering where they are. And I was like, we need to call the ranger at this point. Well, they come cruising back up the road with the ranger um, because they had found him somewhere outside the park. They called and said, we need to get back up to Peavine. And it was kind of an interesting day. But every trail is, should be marked. God marks the Broadway. He tells us very descriptive what the Broadway is. It leads to destruction. How many times have you seen somebody stand at the crossroads of the Broadway and they look at I've watched young people. I've watched college students. They stand there and you're going... Uh, you, you, you saw your big sister or big brother try this and it about killed them. Uh, don't go there. But they still stand at the crossroads and go, but it won't happen to me. You know what I mean? Have you ever had that? Or you have the alcoholic that you sit there and you go, you've seen your grandparents do this. You saw your father do this. And now it's you, but I can handle it. It, it won't happen to me. Or you can see many times that people say, I'm looking for my own way. Hollywood will celebrate every other way but the cross, don't they? They'll put a Tom Cruise on television, and as weird as he is, now he's a pretty good actor, but as weird as he is, they'll put him on there and talk about Scientology. And if you want to try to figure out Scientology, you've got to be weird to figure it out. And they'll celebrate it as something that should be celebrated. But you put the power of the cross that divides us at a certain point because it's the Word of God that divides us asunder. And it says, this is what it's got to be. Jesus Christ is the only way. We all stand at that trailhead and we look. You go this way, this is the broad way. This leads to destruction. But he, and this is the narrow way. And this is what I would call the mercy trail that God lets us go on. The judgment trail where the broader is going, everybody's heading down that trail. And I want to tell you, I wished I could get with young people before they go to college. And I would tell them, I'd say, look, you're going to see the masses. They're heading down a trail of destruction. I've held their head when they're throwing up because they're so drunk they can't stand up. They're heading down this road of destruction. doesn't mean eternal. It just means their lives will be forever altered by what happens in those four years of partying. Their lives are forever altered. And I wonder what it's going to take for them to stand at that trailhead and say, look, it is not worth it. We have a lot of young people today. They say, we're going to do this. This is so neat and so new. There's nothing new under the sun. Same bag of tricks. The devil comes to you. He says, here, try this. Same bag of tricks the last generation did. It's just different packaging. That's all it is. And I wonder if we stand at the trailhead even in our own life. There are choices that every one of us make. And God said, here's the mercy trail. And I want to tell you something. It doesn't look, it's adventuresome, but it doesn't look near as inviting as the broad trail. We can just take, for instance, not just the party and drinking you see in college, but take, for instance, any aspect of your life. When God's calling you to be obedient to Scripture, He's telling you this is the mercy trail you need to take. This is the trail, and the trailhead leading to mercy will always lead there. We were traveling out west in the RV, and I love doing that. And Larry, there's a passion that's still alive. I mean, Larry and them like doing that. We were traveling out there on I-90. And we go going out to Spokane, and, and I, I found it fascinating because I'm just kind of watching the road. It was a good thing because I was driving. <laughs> and I'm watching the road, but out there on I-90, there's a river called the Clark Fork River. That thing parallels the road, it zigzags the road, and I know it's because the road was built in the valley, you don't want to build a road on the high parts, but it's built in the valleys where all the water comes down. But I, I can remember driving down the I-90 there, up there, going to Spokane, and I'm thinking, will this river never end? I keep crossing over. Every time you cross over, you see another sign, Clark Fork, Clark Fork, Clark Fork, Clark. And anyway, it's just zigzagging, it parallels, it zigzags. But then the Lord 
speaking. He said, Donnie, that's my mercy that intersects everyone's life. And I put signposts to tell him that. I put a trailhead to say, that's the, the mercy of God that has intersected your life. That's where the cross found its way into your life. That's how God's refreshing has found its way. Sometimes I'm going down the road and that, that mercy trail, that mercy river is intersecting me. It's running parallel to me. And there are sometimes I just need to stop and be refreshed. There are times it zigzags and goes across into my life. There are sometimes I feel like I'm smack dab in the middle of it. But every bit of that is what God calls us to. When we live the life of the cross, that means that every day, every choice needs to be centered around Christ. Everything. And I look at the power of the cross and I see it all through Scripture, the zigzagging, the mercy trail. It crisscrosses all of our lives. You look at Abraham and I look where the mercy trail hit him on that mountaintop when he was taking, Abraham, he was taking Isaac up there to sacrifice. You know where he found? He said, when Isaac looking around, he's like, where's the lamb? Where, where are we going to sacrifice? Here's the mercy trail that God already put there. All God called Abraham to be is walking in obedience. And when you're walking in obedience, the mercy trail, the mercy river, whatever you want to call it, zigzags our life. Here he is standing on the mountain and he's looking at Isaac going, this is my only son. I really don't want to do this, but it's a type and shadow of the cross to come. My only son to be sacrificed. And God had the rustling of the bushes over here. That's the mercy trail. That's what God provides for us, even in the midst of our walking. You look at Jacob when he finally comes to the end of himself because, you know, he's going back to meet his brother thinking, you know, I can lose my life. What I've done to my brothers is later in his life and I could lose my life. So he sends up presents. He sends people on a cross. And he says, I'm going to stay back. You know, whatever was working in Jacob's mind at that time, I want to tell you something. It was coming to the end of Jacob's self, himself. He met God that place, right by a river, right by a fork in the river. That was a place where mercy found him. That was a place where he wrestled with God. He said his life was forever altered. They never ate the meat again from the hip bone. But it, the Israelites, they were commanded as a reminder what happened from Jacob turning to Israel, from the deceiver to God's beloved. There was something took place. There was a fork in the river. There was a place where God met him. It was the cross point of his life, the crossroad. There's a place he met him there, forever changed. You'll see it all zigzagging through Scripture. I can go through several of those examples like that. You'll see Moses when he's looking at all the people. And one of the most ex explicit examples of that is followed up here in John, where you'll see when Moses had all the people were being bitten by venomous snakes. And this was one of the things that he told them to do. He says, take the pole and put it there and put one of the snakes on there. And said, if anybody's been bitten with a snake, all you got to look, look upon that and you'll be healed. You'll find this in John in the, in the third chapter. It says this, it said, I have spoken to you of earthly things. You will not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heaven things? No one has ever gone to heaven except for the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert upon the cross, and that's where the doctors get their little symbol from, the, so the Son of Man must be lifted up so that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. A crossroad. There was a point that God, and there were several of those that you'll see when the Israelites had left. Egypt. There were several places where it was the water, whether it was the, the pole, the snake being lifted on. It was all types and symbols of coming to a place where you had to believe even in the cross that was coming. The sacrificial system that was set up, even the painting of the door frames when they were leaving Egypt, you'll find with the sacrificial blood of the lamb and the first blood, the firstborn was saved. You'll find that that blood of the lamb that you'll see in the sacrificial system of the temple, that blood was pointing to this very cross that we have. And you say, what is it pointing to the cross? Because the sacrificial lamb is what makes the message of the cross so powerful. The power of the cross is that we believe that Jesus Christ is, is, not was, is the Son of God. He was, is, and always shall be. He is the Son of God. That's the power of our message. So when somebody asks you, what does that cross symbolize? If you're a Christian, you just say it symbolizes Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Not just A, you're a Mormon if it's just A. But the Son of God. 
Because that's the power of the cross and that's what it pointed to and that's that mercy river, that mercy trail that we can see all through Scripture. You'll see in James where I, I, I hope one day we can all understand that mercy will triumph over judgment. But I do believe God's judgment is going to be poured out in this world, the wide and broad way, way of destruction of what He says. But it's because men and women have chosen against the cross. The cross was interjected 2,000 years ago into this world. It was interjected so that we might have hope. I don't know if you've ever done it, but I have. Have you ever tried to work your way out of a sin or regret? That's the most miserable existence you can get into. I mean, even as a Christian, we do that. We work our way out of sin and regret, don't we? Oh, I, I messed up, God, so now I'm going to do this. Look. When we see in the scripture in Colossians, what we read just a few minutes ago, when you see in the scripture there, you'll see that it says that we were dead in our sins. We, look, we were wired for our sinful nature back from the fall of the Garden of Eden. We're wired to sin. Because God put this mercy trail all through scripture. He says, look, I've got a hope that's coming. And that hope is going to come and it's going to be upon a cross. And the whole type and shadow things of, of pointing to this cross that we have today. This is the very thing that the saints of old long for this day in which we live of the message of the cross that can save the world. That's why the world looks at the cross and is scared of the cross. Because if you're bound for that destruction and you don't want to change, the cross is an enemy to you because the cross makes you make a decision. It's the trailhead to life. The world would look at you and say, you don't have life. All you have a bunch of do's and don'ts. No, no, no. I don't have to live according to the do's and don'ts. I have a new want to in my life because the cross has been interjected. The bitter waters and the, the wood that's been put there or this viper of sin and destruction in my life has been resolved because I can look upon the Son of God. That's the message of our cross. The message is that our life has been intersected and, and, and we were basically kidnapped by death, sin, the grave. That's not why God wired us. That's not the way God designed this thing. But when death and our, the choices were made in Genesis, death came into this world because one man fell. And we find that because of one was giving. And you'll see that in Corinthians. Because one was given, the second Adam, we can now have life. And here's what he says here, and you'll find in Colossians, the second chapter. We were once dead, but here's what he has done. He has forgiven us of all of our sins. That's the message of the cross, folks. I don't even understand it all. But the message of the cross. He said he forgave, canceling the written code. Now, one story I read on this was actually in the Roman world that when you got arrested, they would put all of your sins, everything that you had done on the doorpost of your cell. Then they'd put the time that you were supposed to serve. And in that time that you were supposed to serve was up there and the jailer would have to come by and check off every year, every month, every time. And it wasn't until you had served your whole time that you had to take that to the judge, get it notarized. And once you had the judge's notarization on that, after the judge says, yes, the jailer says you've paid your price. The jailer says because of these sins, you spent this time and you would take it to the judge and the judge say, okay, canceled. You had to keep that piece of paper with you at all times because some of the kin folks, some of the people that you had done wrong make it find you. I say, but you are, you, and then you whip out that piece of paper and say, look, it's canceled according to this judge's order. Folks, I'm going to tell you, when your sins are canceled, God's not looking for you to make up the deficit. The power of the cross is that he has canceled the written code against us. He has canceled our sins. That's the good news that the forgiveness of sins, and that's the power of the cross. That's what the world is looking for. You know, in every other religion, you have to work to get to God. You realize that? I mean, there are works oriented. In Ephesians, it says, it is not by works, lest we become prideful, we become boastful, and we become our own person, our own God. God's not interested in that. He's interested in us looking to the cross just as they did in the desert when the snakes were biting them. They looked to him and said, all you have to do to be healed is to look to the cross. It is by faith that we find our healing. And so we look to the cross and by faith we know that Jesus Christ was a historical person that lived upon this earth. There is no doubt about that. 
Every religion acknowledges that Jesus Christ, either a prophet, but we say he's the son of God. I mean, we look at that and we say he was a historical person that lived on this earth. We believe he was God sent to earth as his son. And when he was the perfect nailed to the cross, every one of your sins, past, present, future, have been forgiven. That's the power of the cross. When the world is clamoring, trying to make up for their sins, or the world doesn't even acknowledge what sins are anymore, and we're saying, look, we're all sinners only saved by His grace. That's the power of the cross. The second thing you'll find in this passage of Scripture, the power there and how mercy has come into our life, how it's intersected. And the second thing you'll find that not only has He given us forgiveness, but He has canceled our indebtedness to Him forever. Those sins that we had, every one of us that we had, you know, when you say I'm forgiven is one thing. It's another thing to say, my indebtedness. And now I choose to be indebted to God. I choose that because of what he has done. He's not only canceled the written code against us. He, stood, he said he, took, he stood opposed to us. He said he took away nailing it to the cross. Why is the cross so powerful? Why is it the most scary thing that you can't have it in a public display today? Because of the message behind it. You're going to have to come to a crossroad. Everyone will at some point. You're going to have to do something with Jesus. The cross symbolizes the work, the finished work that is there. And it's no longer up to us to be our own God or to take care of our own sins. But God has sent Jesus so that we may have that forgiveness. He's canceled our indebtedness. And then the third thing you find there is that he says he has triumphed all the powers and authorities. He made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. I love also how he puts it in Colossians when he tells us about the, the, the triumphal party that we can have in 2 second, second Corinthians. It says, but thanks be to God who always leads us in triumphal procession in Christ. And through us everywhere spreads the fragrance of the knowledge of him. What is that? It's the power of the cross. Everywhere we go, what is our message? God has sent his son into this world, Jesus Christ. He died on the cross because I couldn't pay for my sins. He was the perfect that died on the cross for me. He was God's lamb that was a sacrifice for me. Therefore, I have a new life. That's our fragrance of knowledge of him. For we are to God the aroma of Christ among those who are being saved and are in those who are perishing. To the ones, the smell of death. To the other, it's the fragrance of life. And who is equal to such a task? Unlike so many, we do not peddle the word for profit. On the contrary, in Christ, we speak before God with sincerity like men sent from God. I love this triumphal procession that he has put. You know, our life and it's not that I go out and I buy the biggest cross I can and I put it around my neck and walk around like this. It's that I take the cross of Christ every day. When the Bible says you take up your cross daily, I take up that message that I've been forgiven, past, present, future. But not only that, I am living my life every day at the trailhead and saying, okay, God, I choose the path of mercy that you've given me. I'm not going to work my way to you. I'm not going to try to make it up to you. But what I'm going to do is live my life in honor of what you did on the cross so that people can see that triumphal procession every day. And I'm leading that parade saying, Jesus is my Lord. I've been forgiven. You know, the world's waiting on it. They don't know they've been forgiven. That's why you got nutcases over in the Middle East that are killing people trying to get to paradise. They don't know this message. That's the nuttiest thing you can find, some of the people over there. You got people that just don't get it. They're saying, well, there's no power in that. Well, folks, I'll tell you something. If we live the power of the cross, that means we live the resurrected Christ. The power of the cross is not just the message of him dying on the cross. It's that he died and he disarmed every one of our enemies. You know the number one enemy disarmed? Death. And because he has disarmed death. The power of sin is in the power that death has is in sin. They work together to bring us down. But here's what God has done. He said those who believe, according to John the fifth chapter, he said they've already passed over from death to life. I believe the belief of the cross it's what gives us power every day. And we put the cross in our life and say, God, every day I want to make a choice that I live in that, what, that realm with you. That people will see that Jesus Christ is my Savior, my Lord. 
And because of the, I'm telling you, because of the power, and that's what people are looking for, they're going to want that. And you'll lead that triumphal procession in preaching the message, not just wearing a cross. It's not an external thing. It's an internal thing. It changes from the inside out. 2,000 years ago, he split time. He is the beginning and the end. He is our message. And you look at Colossians, second chapter. Look, when you see that, you see the power of the cross. That's why people are scared to death of it. That's why people look at it and they go, we can't have that because the message behind it is it's life-altering, life-changing, but it also is life-flowing. And there's power in it. You see, every song we sang today was out of the cross. Something to do with the cross because there's power. That's our message. And folks, I want to tell you, as a Christian, if somebody asks you about the cross in your life and you can't explain it, you can't explain when the cross intersected your life, here's what I ask you today. Make sure you can explain at some point when Jesus Christ entered into your life. Some point you can say, I gave my heart to Jesus. You didn't osmosis into this thing. You had to come to a point and say, yes, it might be a season in your life, but it can be instantaneous also. But this point was when I gave my life to God. That's the most critical point of the message of the cross. Otherwise, it's not internalized. And then for the Christians here today, if you messed up, here's the good news. The power of the cross provides a forgiveness. You feel like you're sitting in a jail cell with all your indebtedness out on the outside. Guess what? You've got an intercessor in heaven that comes by as the judge is saying, paid in full, paid in full. Now you can stay in that jail. And a lot of people do, condemnation. You can stay in it. But I'm telling you, if anybody goes up and looks at the outside of your door, they're going, you're kind of dumb for sitting here. The door's open, paid in full marked on it. Why are you still sitting here? Let's get going. That's the power of the cross. Past, present, future gives us the hope. Let's stand together. Father, we thank you for the blessing that you give us. And I ask you, Lord God, that you will just allow your Holy Spirit just to give us the, the, the hope of life. And Lord, we ask you that the power of the cross be what's so evident in us. And Father, we ask you that even now that you will just move in us and just allow your Holy Spirit just to, just to show us maybe there's some aspects of our life that, that we're trying to make up to you. You're not interested in our, our, our pitily offerings, but you're interested in us giving our hearts and life to you. Father, we thank you for how that you've loved us, how that you cared for us. And I ask you, Lord, the power of the cross is there in every one of our lives. And we thank you so much for how that you love us and you find that forgiveness in our lives. I pray that we can do that, Lord. And the message of the cross is what's going to change this world. In the name of Jesus. We'll sing the last two verses of... Oh, the pure delight of a single life that before thy throne when I kneel in prayer with Thee, my God, I commune as friend with friend. Draw me nearer, nearer, blessed Lord, to the cross where Thou hast died. Draw me nearer, 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 blessed Lord. There are depths of love that I cannot know till I cross the narrow sea. There are heights of joy that I may not reach till I rest in peace with thee. Draw me Father, may we go from this place.
proclaiming the message of the cross. And may the world know that it is worth it. Every drop of blood you shed on the cross was for our forgiveness and our new life. And we thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Have an awesome day. Luncheon over next door.